Okay, we can start. It's time. So, <laughs> I'm actually one of those people who, who uh, is using geeks in the production environment. Yeah, the web website is called uh, gnetwork.org. It's uh, hosted by um, University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. Um, and this is a, a site that has been developed over the last 20 years. Yeah, so even though it's, uh, it's in essentially a simple setup, you know, we're running Python and MySQL to offer these services, um, I'm going to explain to you, you know, how it got out of hand a bit. Anyway, what is, uh, what is Geeks to me? It's, uh, it's all about sleeping at night. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the last 20 years I've been managing systems and sometimes, uh, you know, running 40 servers or something in that order. Um, and you would get a call in the middle of the night and somebody says, you know, hey, you got to run to the data center. You know, that's something I really want to avoid. I could have somebody else go now, I think. But even so, um, you know, we, we, we are doing better. So it's about controlled software deployment, and it's about controlling the full dependency graph, and I'll explain that in a bit. And also, you know, what you want to do, is, as Ludo so nicely pointed out, is you want to, your system to be deterministic. You know? Once you deploy it, you want, to be, you want to really know it's the one that you actually deployed. Oh, sorry. So I'm going to talk about four things. Um, one is uh, deployment in a developing, testing, staging, and production environment. The second point I want to discuss is easy installation, and I'll get to, yeah, that will be the longest point. <laughs> Distributed workflows I'll discuss shortly, and then orchestration of services is something we could see as a next step. So when you talk about deployment, um, the network is essentially simple, but it's all about dependencies, you know, and there's a link here at the bottom. This, this slide you can, uh, you can find online, and I'm going to educate you a little bit what it looks like. So this is a graph that has uh, been produced by, uh, by Geeks, you know, when you put all the dependencies together. It can, it can show you an SVG, and I hope I can scroll it. Yeah. So somewhere at the top. There's G Network, right? So this is this is actually the the starting point. So G Network depends on quite a few things. And let's go sideways, see what's here. So there's there's Redis, okay. And there's RQTL, which is a, an R library. There's Python parallel in there. Uh, sorry for the. Okay, so here are some of the R packages, many of which uh, Ricardo has uh, has made as packaged. Yeah, so yeah, it continues for a bit. And then uh, let's see, there's also somewhere uh, uh, oops. How to config, yeah, so fonts, cups is even there. God knows why. <laughs> um, so this is the glibc stuff, and then we're getting in XML parsing, we're getting into fonts. The X, X, some X stuff somehow. So how is this all possible? Well, let's see what's here. I'm missing out on the Python stuff because it's also quite huge. Anyway, LZ4 is there. Valgrind's even there. Glibc is fortunately there. Or it's, it's Glib. Anyway, so to build a, a system deterministically, you know, you have the immediate dependencies, which are quite obvious. Yeah, so you have, maybe you're using uh, SciPy, yeah, or, or RQTL, which depends on a few other R packages. But you also, you know, to get to this environment to deploy it, uh, these packages have their own dependencies. Yeah, so when I showed this to uh, my professor, he said, "How come Ruby's in there? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not supposed to be any Ruby in there. Yeah, but there's a dependency on Ruby somewhere. You know, one of these packages requires Ruby." Yeah, so this is the stuff we're finding out. And the versioning is extremely important, right? I mean, when you want to have something deterministic, you don't want to, under your, you know, to, to be building on shifting sand. Yeah, so we have actually, one thing I didn't show you, but there are three Pythons in there. There's Python 2.4, Python 2.7, and Python 
three, I think, or 3.1, wherever they are. Yeah, so there are packages de also depending on different pythons. Yeah, so let's go back to the slides. <coughs> yeah, so essentially what is simple is, is actually not so simple. Yeah, and there, there's also dependencies for OpenBLAST and Atlas, which are kind of competing libraries. And then there's the Ruby dependency, and the number of dependencies is actually growing over time. Yeah, any any time you add a package, you'll get more dependencies in. And I've so far avoided uh, doing the JavaScript stuff because <laughs> the JavaScript we're loading ad hoc now, which which uh, npm is actually great at, yeah, the the Node package manager. But it's it's such a mess; it's unbelievable. How am I doing for time? So, <clears throat> also in development, the developers were using different s systems essentially, right? I mean, they were doing it ad hoc. So you say, okay, I want Python, so you install Python. Yeah, you want to uh, install SciPy, you will get a version of SciPy. Yeah, and and you know, this raises real questions. For, you know, if you find a bug, is it actually you know inside the code base itself, or is it in inside the you know the underlying dependencies? There's not a chance of reproducing these. Yeah, unless you work on exactly the same machine. Um, so I, you know, a year ago, heroically, I started packaging this stuff in GNU Geeks. And basically, essentially, what I did is I, I took a, a checkout of, the, of uh, Geeks itself. Yeah, so I, took, I started from the trunk of, uh, of Geeks um, and start building it from there. Yeah, this means that uh, you know, I, at that point in time, I sort of uh, fixated the environment, right? So I was using exactly that version of Python yeah, that was already was in Geeks. The problem with Geeks is that if you if you keep up updating the Geeks the Git tree of Geeks itself, these packages change also, right? So over time, you will you will be hitting uh, issues with dependencies that are not working anymore. So I fixated it in February, and. Next to that, I was using the Geeks package path, so I put in my own packages, right, or our own packages. And in this in this repository, the link is here. There are now some hundred plus packages, um, and some of them are duplicates now with the trunk because the trunk has moved on. Yeah, and I actually did synchronize in August last year, um, and it was non-trivial actually to move from February to August, yeah, because there were a number of packages that you know were duplicates, but there were also packages that, that somehow were broken, so I had to revert on things. Yeah, so switching, you know, half uh, after half a year to a new, uh, an updated uh, Geeks tree, is non-trivial actually. You know, it's, it's, uh, I'm not looking forward to the next one because it's going to cost me a day, maybe two days. It's, it'll be possible, yeah, but it's it's something that it's work that you're never looking forward to. So another solution I put in is uh, using shared profiles. So essentially what we do now is we have G network we fixated it the, the the geeks tree we fixed it the geeks package path with our own packages and then we deploy it right so we deploy it in something called user local shared gn staging so this is a staging branch and then the the version of the of the of the tree right so when we get to the next stage if we want to move it to production what I should do is I'll mount it on I'll mount the profile on the user local shared gm production with this particular version, yeah. So it's a, this is how we move forward, and all the all the uh, developers, they, they and uh, you know deployment people, they share the same structure. So we know exactly at any point in time what is actually in G Network 2.0 A8 FC FF4, yeah, based on the August August checkout of Geeks. So Geeks channels could be an improvement, and that's what I'm going to touch on in a bit. So some some discussion we have on the mailing list. We'll just, yeah, geeks channels uh, do not exist at this point, right? But the idea is <laughs> um, that we fi fix it, that we allow people to provide different versions of the geek of, of the geeks tree. Yeah. So for example, you know, if you are you have a product uh, like G Network, and I want to s tell somebody else, you know, please install this product at this version, I would provide him a channel essentially. I would say I would tell him, you know. Say, tell Geeks to use this channel, and from that point onwards, you know, he'll be installing software from that particular version of the tree. Yeah, that's, that's ideally what I want. And you could also roll backwards. You could say, okay, you know, I, I have, you know Ruby 1.8.7, uh, 
is a very old Ruby and sometimes you need it, yeah, you could actually provide a channel for that. Say, okay, I'm going to provide a Ruby 1.8.7 channel that other people can use, right? Which is, which is disconnected from the main geeks branch, the main geeks trunk. Um, another thing that is a problem with, you know, geeks package path at this point is disconnected because it actually doesn't look like the geeks tree itself. Right, so if you create a package in, in your own uh, Geeks package path and you want to migrate it into trunk, it's actually a bit of work. Yeah, and it's, work is not good. Yeah, so if, you, if, we, if we had a channel that, that, you know, which is actually a reflection of the, of the, of the, of the Geeks tree, it would, it would all be become much more trivial you know, to, to merge patches with the main trunk. So for now, I'm the one who is uh, juggling branches. Yeah, because I cannot even explain to others how to do this stuff. And they're not ready for it. So the second part of my talk was, is about installation, and I, I gave this, this, this also yesterday for the HPC uh, group. We also have the problem that we are running on high-performance high computing systems and supercomputers. Yeah, so we want to run Geeks packages there. Um, and you know, these guys <laughs> and gals who manage these systems, they're, re they're highly resistant to giving you root. <laughs> yeah, they, want, they don't want to give you administrator privileges. Yeah, so, and Geeks itself, you know, requires a Geeks daemon to install stuff. So that's, that's you know, to start that you need uh, administrator privileges. Um, it's a no-go in many HPC environments. You know, there's a few exceptions now, but it's, yeah, rule there is, has got one. Um, but it's rare. It's, it'll come over time, you know, people, the administrators will start to realize that we actually are saving them time. And they get better environments, but anyway. So, um, the alternative is, uh, you know, people, people to circumvent this question in, in HPC environments, what they start to do is use stuff like Brew, Conda, Easy Build, which actually are built environments that work under a local user account. Um, the downside of these systems, these build systems, is that they're non-reproducible. Well, they're reproducible as, as long as you're using the same home directory that you're in, you know, building stuff in. But also, it's hard to share. You know, it's hard to share these, these build tools. And you need to build from scratch every time, which is a lot of work. You need to bootstrap. Yeah? Um, Docker and, and container solutions in HPC environments are not an option. Yeah, there are actually HPC environments that are trying to provide them now. Um, but you know, even Docker needs uh, administrator privileges, and people are always worried, you know, that their systems are going to get screwed. So something I wrote in the last couple of months is called relocatable geeks, and it was based on an insight which uh, I had uh, with Elko Dolstra a few years back at Fosdem, and Elko was here a few hours ago, but he left. Uh, he's the he's the inventor of Nix. Yeah, and, Nick and Geeks was forked, forked from Nick, so you know, there, there are many shared similarities. And one of them is that you know, we have a, a, a path, slash GNU, slash store, and then we have a hash value, glibc version, and then, for example, the, the name of the file. Right, and the key insight is that this, you know, this is, if you look into files, this is quite recognizable, right? This hash value is unique. So what about you know, just um, patching these files with and something new? If you look at uh, LDC2, which is a decompiler, yeah, and, you're, and you look at the shared libraries that it uses, you can see this pattern of, of, uh, of uh, hash values, right? All fingerprints. Yeah, some of them are shared, so the glibc ones are shared. Ooh. Sorry. So how about relocating those, yeah? So re replace them with something is a target prefix. So if you have a home directory, slash home, slash user, yeah, we're going to replace them. And it will look like this, right? So in this case, I, I install it in the home directory, opt, LDC test, and then, you know, I've rewritten the hash value to look like this, and these are the files. So after installation of this, uh, this LDC2, it's actually sitting in a home directory, in slash opt, and will this resolve? And the answer is yes, it will just work. Yeah, so just to reiterate, yeah, we are replacing that value with that value. And 
me see. Looks like I'm skipping something. But anyway, um, now I did this uh, as an experiment, and uh, I used uh, Elko. Elko also created a, cool, a tool called, called Patch Elf, which which actually allows you to rewrite Elf files, um, and it worked. And for textual files like Ruby, Perl, and Bash scripts that have the same fingerprints, it also works to replace them. But some formats like uh, compiled Python files and JVM files, you know, it turned out to be a little less easy. Mostly because they're not zero terminated strings. You know, they're, they're actually strings that are that give a, they have a length uh, indicator in, in, pr in front of them. So one night I came up with a solution. I said, why, why don't I keep the f you know the size of this path exactly the same, so I don't have to wor you know worry about what it actually looks like inside the file, you know, whether it's serial terminated or has some other length indicator. So that was the second insight. So if you see these two paths, you know, now they have the exact same length. I just passed it in, you know, you, you just slam them in, and it works. It's definitely the easy way to go. <laughs> yeah? So I replaced it in all files. There are some URLs on here where, where all these projects are, so you can, you can visit them at leisure if you want. Yeah, so this is uh, the idea. You know, in this case, I have home user opt in the first one, so I slam it in. In the second case, I, I tell it to install a user local share LDC 1.01. And you can see it says the exact same length. And what I do is actually I cannibalize the hash value. Yeah, so it becomes shorter in the second case because the prefix is longer. Yeah, you can cannibalize a long way. You know, I can, I can cannibalize all the way back to it doesn't exist anymore. And then I can go a bit further too. And if you add it all up, you, you have about 40 letters, letters you can use as a prefix you know, to come up with these unique paths. And cannibalizing the hash value is not that important in this case because in, in geeks, we use it to isolate, you know, all these all these uh, uh, directories. But in this case, I tell it to install it somewhere unique. Yeah, so I'm I'm, st I'm telling it to install it in this folder, or in the LDC test folder over there. Yeah. So what it in the end looks like internally it doesn't matter because we're not sharing. Yeah. Uh, okay. So for the LDC compiler, there's an example. You can actually download this. It's it's online. Um, it's, a f the, it's a 40 megabyte download, you unpack it, it's about 140 megabytes. Installation of the binary takes three seconds on my laptop. So this is very different from, you know, these easy build ideas. Uh, or even Docker installations. You know, this is very lightweight. Yeah, the only thing I'm doing is replacing all the paths. And there's many people who've, uh, who've tested this now for the decompiler. So yeah, they're happy. And also, yeah, there's two other things that are important. One is that the um, shared library, that actually, you know, this, this package, I can call it a package now, contains the shared libraries all the way down to glibc. And even the Linux loader is in there. Yeah, so with many systems, you have this problem that if you deploy binaries um, somewhere else, yeah, you will get uh, conflicts, for, for example, because they want to load the underlying distributions glibc or libc, yeah, or LZ4, LZ4 library or whatever. You know, and, and there, can be, there can be problems, there can be uh, mismatches. So you see a lot, a lot of inter, uh, internet forums, they discuss you know, these problems about libraries not working. And that's the reason. Got 10, more, 10 more minutes. So I also did the same thing with Ruby, SSL, and Nokogiri. Well, Nokogiri is infamous for installation, <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's a Ruby gem that depends on uh, libxml2, and it's you know the internet is just you know I think half of the internet is filled with messages about people having problem installing Nokogiri. It just works. In Sambamba is a tool we uh, we developed. It's written in, in D, and is used in many high sequencing in sequencing uh, high performance computer centers around the world. And there was a very very one hard to reproduce very one very hard to reproduce bug. Um, it sec faults occasionally, right? Under, in some conditions, on some environments, but it's never reproduced. But we can see it pop up once in a while. So I created a binary distribution. It was deployed on a cluster in Australia. Um, they ran it for a day. They saw some of these uh, uh, sec faults. They ran the D GDB debugger against it, and we found the exact location where the sec fault happened, and we fixed it. And it's actually not in Sambamba, but it's upstream. Yeah, so I'm actually doing remote debugging. Somebody else is running it, 
and I'm helping with the debugging. And we're doing more. We're gonna we're gonna add more. So the potential uh, here is also that you know we can actually create one st one click installs, yeah, for binary packages. Um, yeah, and it's something I want to discuss also in the future of gigs. There, there are security uh, concerns, of course. You know, when you create a binary that's downloadable from the web and you just install it, you know, with your eyes closed. Uh, we need to work on that somehow. But uh, I think uh, it is really cool that we can actually use a Geeks package that is well tested and has been, you know, possibly been used by already 100,000 people. And we just deploy it by rewriting the, the internal paths. So the second, the third part of this talk, and I hardly have time left, so that's going to be really short. Um, is about workflows. You know, we have um, a need for running tools in order, sequentially and in parallel on these high, high performance uh, computing systems. And essentially it's called a workflow. And there's been many f standards that have been developed for workflows. Uh, at the moment there's a project going on, it's called the Common Workflow Language, and it has a lot of uh, momentum in our community. Um, and it started nice, you know, it started really as a good idea because it says, you know, it started as a descriptive document of the workflow. But soon uh, they, they uh, embedded JavaScript because they wanted to do more, they wanted to avoid repetition. Um, and they also have looping now. <laughs> yeah, so deterministic it no longer is. Um, and the, you know, when you look at these workflow standards, uh, you know, occasionally someone will pop up and create a new standard, like this one. And it turns out it's actually quite hard to do, yeah, because people want to put in the kitchen sink. That's what the, really the problem is. Mm, sorry. So Geek essentially is already already a workflow engine, right? I mean, we can do uh, we can handle dependencies, which is serial execution. And we can also handle parallel execution in a way because of the build farm, you know, the way the build farm has been designed. Yeah, so Rule is going to talk about uh, workflows at, uh, at uh, 3.30 in this room. Yeah, and he's, he's been doing a lot of work in this area. I'm not saying that, you know, build farms are a great idea, but <laughs> he's probably doing something else. And the fourth part of the talk is uh, orchestration. So, um, you know, making the rounds, visiting companies and, and, and academic institutions. This is something that pops up every time, you know. We, we you know, we, people are using tools like Puppet and, 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 and Chef and likewise. Um, <coughs> but we, and Ludo describes services, which are services running inside a computer. But we also have services that run out across computers now, right? So we, ha yeah, we have systems that depend on each other. And this is called orchestration. Yeah? One service may need another service to run. Yeah, how do you, how do you uh, set up the order of these? Um, and when the one service goes down, what do the other services do, right? So this is called orchestration. And I think uh, for, with the functional paradigm that we have with, with Geeks, we can actually you know, push forward to, to make things happen here too. So that's maybe something for the final uh, uh, discussion today, which is about the future of Geeks. Conclusion. Geeks allows for a controlled and sane software deployment with profiles and Git, yeah, the way I'm doing it. And we should have channels to make it easier for me. <laughs> uh, Geeks has uh, relocatable binary packages now, you know, and uh, we should continue experimenting with that and see how far it gets us. Geeks will handle ra workflows, I, I have no doubt, because Rule is working hard on it. And orchestration should be on the agenda. That's my conclusion. And I have acknowledgments for people who are working. Yeah, so Rule, Ludo, and Ricardo especially. Um, the GNU Geeks communities, which, you know, one of the things that really strikes me with Geeks is, is that it, and Guile, is that it attracts so many really intelligent people. So I'm really happy you're here. Um, and then I want to thank Professor Robert Williams, who's paying my bills. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So Chris, you can set up. Sure. All right. Have we got any questions? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm curious if somebody will ask you the source code. The source code of what? Of the 
the the the the the the the the the the the the the the the the the the the the the no, I, so the question is, uh, am I, should I be afraid uh, about uh, you know the source code? That uh, if somebody asks for it, and you know it's all online. I, I only do open source software. Okay, well, uh, but you have special packages in the package part. Okay. You have your own processing things. Yeah, yeah. So I, I we do have uh, Geeks package path, but it's also online. It's out in the open. Yeah, so I, I, I'm highly resistant to using uh, any type of proprietary software. Yeah, but al also our own systems are all completely in the open. You know, it's all open source software. So the gig, gig, gigs package path is just uh, a construct where you can uh, import a second Git tree into the packaging tree, right? And but this second packaging tree is just I need it because it's it's not on the main tree. But it is out in the open, you know, anyone can use it, anyone can update it. And another question, um, how do you save uh, the package, uh, previous package version? Sorry, that <laughs> missed the last bit again. Uh, how do you save a previous package version? Do you just copy and paste a piece of text? Or? Yes, yeah, so that, how, how do we uh, handle the, the versioning? Yeah, so yeah, we, we, you have to explicitly for every package say, okay, this is the version I, I want to use. Right, or the git checkout or whatever. And that's you, you describe in the package. Have a look at the links that, uh, that are in my, my talk, yeah, because it's all there. Any, yes? Okay, so yeah, the question is how do we handle uh, Python packages in Geeks? Um, that there's really three ways to do this, to go about this. Um, the, the, the best way is to actually write uh, Geeks packages for Python modules, yeah, which, de which describe their dependencies also. Uh, and you install the package with Geeks, and it, and it, uh, it, pulls, it pulls it in with, with the dependencies. Um, to, make it easy, to make it easy, we also provide a, a, a generator. So you can, you can if, for example, if the package is already in pip, you know, or, or PyPy, or whatever they're called, um, it, it can it can pull that information and then create the package for you automatically in Geeks. Yeah, and for this I use the Geeks package path now, for example. Um, but you're not completely delivered to Geeks because you can also uh, uh, Geeks actually has a package called virtu Python Virtual Environment, so you can start up a virtual environment for for Python and use Python from there. And so you can just use pip and pypy to to pull in packages. And the third option is just to use, you know, a, a source tree, and to to provide that as a as a in, in the Python path. And so, Geeks does not force you to work in any way. You can you can, you know, gradually incrementally work towards the perfect solution. So. Yeah. I should probably put on that microphone thing, huh? Yeah. We also have two minutes left. Oh, yes, sir. I don't, I'm not trying to steal it from you. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs>